Welcome to Close Wars, the podcast that feels as if it has lived three days in the space of one and has the zits on my chin to prove it. <sighs> it's been a long one. I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 186, and it is such a good one, if I do say so myself. Today, I'm going to be joined by artist and all-around slow fashion superstar, you heard it here first, superstar for sure, Michaela Friedman. No joke, Michaela is one of the raddest people I've ever met. She makes these amazing painted upcycled cowboy boots. She also is a key part of the slow fashion scene here in Austin via her work with Mutiny Market and the Slow Fashion Fest. And she's part of Shop Slow, a slow fashion boutique featuring artisanal handmade clothing by a collective of makers who sew custom and one-of-a-kind apparel with a focus on recycled materials. Yes, I did take that description from their website, but it is all in fact true. ShopSlow itself is, in addition to being like a website where you can buy stuff, they actually have a brick and mortar space here in Austin. It is amazing. I got to actually go there and record with Michaela, which was an incredible experience. I am beyond excited for all of you to meet her because this conversation with her got me so excited about the future. And it definitely started a lot of wheels turning for me. Even as I was re-listening to it during the editing process, I was just like, wow, I'm so glad we had this conversation. (laughs) We're going to talk about shop slow, how we can take the slow fashion movement out into the world outside of social media, and how we can make the slow fashion movement stronger and more inclusive. And you'll notice the title of this episode is Slow Fashion is Not a Trend. That was Michaela's idea, and I love it. This week's opening segment is going to be a little longer than usual, perhaps a little longer than planned, which means no room for audio essays this week, but I promise to work as hard as possible to get all of them into the remaining episodes of the year. And if not, well, then they'll be in January, but I'm going to try really, really hard. So last week, Dustin and I drove all the way to Pennsylvania and back. It's 1,600 miles each way. If no one took a pee break, which literally will never happen with me, (laughs) because I'm I'm peeing, (laughs) but if no one needed to take a pee break or needed to sleep or eat, it's a nonstop 24-hour drive each way. We aren't quite that brutal, so we perhaps a little foolishly broke each direction into two 12 plus hours of driving each day. It really turned into like 15, 16 hours each day with stops for gas, food, and the aforementioned peeing. It was a lot. It was really tiring. And, you know, we really had to like, we really had to be connected to each other to get through it together. You know, fortunately, We both like to talk and we have a lot of stuff to talk about, right? We listen to some of our favorite podcasts. Uh, Currently, just in case you were wondering, we like to listen to Band Splained and 30 songs that explain the 90s together because we do do love to talk about music. Um, We also sang along to a lot of 70s and 80s pop country hits because, you know, we're both kids who grew up in the country surrounded by country music. And of course, we talked about a lot of different stuff, including music, like so much stuff. I mean, we did manage to talk about the Smashing Pumpkins for several hours, but they do have an exhaustive catalog. (laughs) But we also talked about something that has been on my mind for a long time, and it was just a great time to kind of verbalize what had been swirling around in my brain and get Dustin's feedback and reaction and thoughts on it. You're like, what could Amanda have been thinking about for all this time and so much? And, you know, I'll tell you, it wasn't fake food, though you do know I love fake food and specifically fake fruit. And it wasn't what kind of dolls were supposed to live in the Laura Ashley dollhouse, which I do somehow own. And the spoiler, the dolls are kind of surprising. I don't have them, but they weren't what I expected. I found them on the internet. Instead, it was this. It was how do we create real lasting change via the slow fashion movement? 
Because there are times that the slow fashion movement, and I can say this as a person who is within it, right? Working within it, spending so much time talking to people within it, thinking within it, creating content within it, having conversations about it within it. There are many times that it has felt kind of like an echo chamber. That's not unusual for any kind of movement, right? That's just how it gets because it starts with community, it grows into movement and your community, you, you kind of become surrounded by people who are similar thinking, right? My worry has been that we aren't really reaching new people, like not enough new people at least. In fact, there are times when the community has felt sort of clicky, sort of closed off to the outside world and And that lack of openness, of outreach, of expanding ourselves beyond the comfort area of one another, it holds us back. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to figure out how to change that. But the reality is that we will never take down fast fashion or combat climate change or end the exploitation and waste of like, you know, fast everything if we aren't bringing more and more and more people into the fold. The truth is that nothing changes without people. And it's it's always ironic to me, but not in a funny funny way at all, that climate change and fast fashion, the plastic pollution crisis, so many bad things, right? They are massive problems created by people. And yet, the solution, here's the ironic part, the solution is people. You, me, everyone we know, and lots and lots and lots of people we have never met. For quite a while, and I know I've said this to y'all before, I have felt that the slow fashion community is not as inclusive and welcoming as it has to be in order to succeed. The biggest organizations and influencers and brands in this space are still centering the same group of people that fashion itself has always centered. Young, thin, often white, wealthy, conventionally attractive people, able-bodied people, the same people that we've been seeing in fashion blogs and magazines and on the runways and in brand marketing our entire lives. And that's like a tiny, tiny, teeny, tiny percentage of the people on this planet. And it's just this teeny little fraction of the people who need to be a part of what we are doing. It's interesting, but slow fashion has to be as unlike the fashion industry as possible if it's going to succeed. Unfortunately, we see too much of the fashion industry's culture and way of doing business carrying over into the slow fashion world. Perhaps because so many of the loudest voices and leaders within this movement came from that industry in the first place. I see so many things happening that could have been ripped out of the pages of any day of my fast fashion buyer diary if I'd ever kept that. Like they're just, it's the same. And that's, that's a problem. Rather than bringing the way of doing things in the fashion industry into this movement, we need to be looking at other successful movements as a model. We need to adopt the techniques of grassroots movements. We have to mobilize a community of all kinds of people who will educate and mobilize the people around them. And on and on and on this domino effect of more and more people reaching one another. Although maybe I don't like the metaphor of a domino effect because it sounds like we're all falling down. And what we're really doing is standing up together. People are what give movements power. And when we're coming up against the fashion industry, the fast everything industry, we're coming up against so much power. We need all the people we can get or we're never going to make a change. One thing I was telling Dustin as we drove, we drove for so long, was that I had read a Vogue business article that was published early this year. And 
then I proceeded to read it on a near weekly basis since then. Like I have it bookmarked in multiple web browsers on multiple devices because it really resonated with me. And it's not going to be in the way you think, but I promise I'll explain to you when we get to that part. It was so powerful to me that I was shocked that I didn't see anyone else talking about it. And I think part of that may have been just the platform it was published on. It's not something that a lot of people read. And I wanted to discuss it. I wanted to share it with you. I wanted to tell you what it had been making me think about, but I felt afraid. And that's because this article is about a pretty beloved organization in the slow fashion movement. It's One of the accounts that really got me into slow fashion in the first place, it's one that I have recommended to so many people over the years. I will say that over time I became sort of, I don't know, like, let's just say I was questioning what they were really doing. There were some things that didn't add up to me. I was wondering what the real results of their work was because something began to feel off to me. The article in question is called Slow Factory Has Hit Reset on Its Climate School Plans. What Happened? And it's written by Bella Webb. It was published in February. And I will share it with you in the show notes because I think it is a very important read. It is not behind a paywall. And I think it's important for you to read less because of the slow factory information and more because of the questions it raises about the sustainability, climate change, slow fashion movements, and what what is happening and what's not happening. For those of you who don't know who Slow Factory is, they are a nonprofit organization, quote, radically imagining and creating solutions addressing climate change through art, design, education, and science, system change for collective liberation. That's from their Instagram bio. And they are major players in this space with more than 600,000 followers and funding partnerships with like Mara Hoffman, MIT, the UN, Adidas, Vestaire Collective, Swarovski. I could list all day. They are getting the funding and they are getting the support. So basically the writer, Bella Webb, was originally assigned to write, well, basically an easy fluff piece about what Slow Factory was going to do next now that it had faced some issues with its climate school. It was supposed to be a really positive story about Slow Factory. But at every turn, as as Webb worked on this, people were turning up who had very negative experiences working with the organization with lots of very bad stories to tell. Ignoring this element of Slow Factory's story became essentially unavoidable. From the article, here's kind of how it begins. Vogue Business first began exploring a story about Slow Factory's 10th anniversary and the upcoming opening of its school in August 2022. Soon after, a group of former contractors and collaborators came forward with concerns about the organization and its plans to open the school. This group claims Slow Factory overpromises on what it does or can deliver. They say it is an open secret that Slow Factory has a toxic culture that undermines its objectives, particularly uplifting and empowering people from the global majority. The article goes on to say, The principal allegation among those with concerns is that the nonprofit has overstated its impact especially on social media, and particularly around job creation and programming. We are deeply concerned about Slow Factory's potential to cause harm at the institutional level by diverting attention, funding, and public support away from organizations that actually do the work Slow Factory claims to do, say the members of this like anonymous collective. This anonymous collective, this is me jumping in here, are a group of former contractors and employees who have banded together to try very, very hard to bring their stories to light. And it's been really, really, really hard because people love Slow Factory, you know? I can assume for Bella Webb, it was scary to write this article. 
The members of the Anonymous Collective also question whether Slow Factory has the thematic expertise or staff to run a project like the Climate School, having left a trail of disillusioned contractors and collaborators in its wake. I mean, this is a tough story. I I want you to imagine that you're going to write this like fluffy, nice, fun, posy piece about an organization that you yourself probably admire, right? Have been inspired by. And this is what you end up having to write. Bella Webb does an incredible job of weaving together the threads of this story. And I got to say, the things she covers are not fully surprising to me because I have seen similar situations over the years within other organizations and movements. Here's another paragraph from the article. The Anonymous Collective points to Slow Factory's 10-year impact report published last summer, where Slow Factory states that it has provided career counseling, internships, and apprenticeships, community care, child care, youth programs, mental health support, access to arts and culture, and collective healing. Former contractors say they are not aware of evidence of such programs being delivered during the time they worked at the organization. The nonprofit doesn't specify who received these benefits or how they were delivered in the report. The article goes deeper into a lot of overstatements and inaccuracies in Slow Factory's claims about its impact and the number of people it really reaches. It's all really, really disheartening. This is a tough pill for me to swallow. Even as at the first time I read this article, I had felt that something, I just had this like weird feeling that something, something wasn't adding up. But to read this piece and think about the number of times this organization had motivated me in the past, it was really, it was depressing. (laughs) Yeah, I guess that's the best adjective I can think of. Please, please go read this. It's a long read with lots and lots of info, and it's no wonder I had to read it like 50 times this year alone because it's very dense. It's very important. The part of the story that was most disheartening to me, but once again, not altogether surprising, not just based on the hunch I was having, but also just based on my experience working for brands that were attempting to merge social justice with capitalism I guess I just wanted better for Slow Factory, you know? The most disheartening thing is that it is a very toxic place to work with bullying, gaslighting, a workplace described as, quote, chaotic, tense, and hostile by the anonymous collective. Workers would be punished for dissent and offering what they saw as constructive feedback. Like this, This triggers some bad memories for me, working in some bad places with some bad leadership. There's a little bit more from this article, and these are quotes that I just felt so viscerally from my own work experience within the fashion industry. God, I wanted this to be so much different. One says the experience shattered their confidence. Another describes their time at Slow Factory as the unhealthiest I've ever been. And another says... I didn't know who I was when I left. They took everything from me. There's a disconnect between the public face and what's going on behind closed doors, says one former contractor. Despite all of the rhetoric around about anti-colonialism, taking time and healing, it was a relentless culture of overwork, hierarchy, and paranoia about loyalty. It's all incredibly disappointing. And I gotta say, Slow Factory's response to... The reporter uh, didn't make me feel better. Didn't make me feel that these people were not telling the truth. It felt very genuine and just so, so disappointing. But to be honest, I'd also, and this is probably where part of my hunch was coming from, that something wasn't adding up. I had heard whispers from various friends and sort of peers in the sustainability slow fashion space about how volatile, specifically that was the word that came up multiple times, how volatile It was to work within the slow factory, to work with them. And how sometimes it was just straight up cruel, a cruel environment. I kind of just filed those stories away as, I don't know. I think I just didn't want to hear it. I said uh, to myself, like, oh, those are just isolated situations, something, just one bad day. But I guess, I mean, I was wrong. By now, you can see why I was not interested in being the first person in the slow fashion community to discuss this article. 
The power dynamics in the slow fashion world are just as intense as any industry or social construct. And I am a one person project with absolutely no power, yet so much to lose. But here's the thing. I haven't come back to read this article 50 times because of the slow factory stuff, although I do think it's important to talk about. It's one paragraph in particular that really has stuck with me, and it was at the heart of that conversation I had with Dustin last week, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you right now. And I want, as I read this, I want you to think about what I said a few minutes ago, how if slow fashion is going to succeed, we can't operate like the fashion industry right? We can't have the priorities of the fashion industry or the way we talk to people like the fashion industry or how we choose people to participate. It can't be like the fashion industry, right? Okay, here's this paragraph. There's a pattern emerging among social media savvy nonprofits whereby the leaders act more like influencers, developing a cult of personality that undermines the drive for decentralized power, says Min Ha Pham, an associate professor at Pratt Institute and author of Why We Can't Have Nice Things, Social Media's Influence on Fashion, Ethics, and Property. This can divert attention from the actual problems nonprofits exist to address and warp public perceptions of what constitutes meaningful impact. And this paragraph is ended by another quote from Pham saying, Popularity can so easily stand in for expertise. This isn't making workers' lives better in the global South. It isn't making the environment safer. It's just creating new internet celebrities. This paragraph really hit home for me because after someone pointed it out, I couldn't stop seeing it. This whole cult of personality idea with this like leader at the top who... You know, humans abuse power sometimes, even the best humans. Like not everyone is meant to be a leader. Not everyone is meant to be a boss. These are hard jobs with a lot of responsibility. I've always told Dustin that I value I value work-life balance way too much to be a cult leader. <laughs> you know, like these are very specific human characteristics that I have seen playing out within so many movements that I've been a part of, you know, but this idea of influence and social media, popularity, likes, follows, using those metrics as the guiding force of a movement. I mean, that's, that's what the fashion industry does, you know, at the same time, how do you divorce yourself from that? Right? Because here's the thing in the slow fashion world. Most of the labor that most of us are doing is completely unpaid or very nearly unpaid. And if we want to get paid for it, we have to work with the brands and groups that have money. To get them to want to work with us, we have to have the social media following that makes it feel like a win for whoever is doling out that money. It puts a lot of focus of resources like time on social media, on you know, accumulating these followers and likes, right? Versus actual work in the community. It's almost a distraction, but you need money to do work in the community. And the organizations that are going to be most likely to give you money that have the money to do it, they're going to be part of the fashion industry. They're going to be your Allbirds, your Everlane, your, I don't know, H&M. H&M puts a lot of money into sustainable fashion research and content. I'm pretty sure H&M partnered with Slow Factory. I mean, it puts everyone who wants to do this work in a really difficult position. And it, in a weird way, the need for the funding, which I feel also, it kind of diverts us from the real work that needs to happen to make change, you know? But it's tough because we all have to live in this world where we have to pay rent and for healthcare and food and, you know, everything else. We can't say, oh, I'm going to stop doing that in the name of this movement. We all need to be able to support ourselves. And so it's just, it creates this really, it creates a quandary, you know? This quandary has 
turned the slow fashion movement into something that's not really doing that much in the outside world. Some organizations like Remake use their funding to sort of manage an army of volunteers around the world who do the community work, holding events, sharing info on social media, et cetera. And that, that is important, but in general, slow fashion and sustainability are still acting as a bit of an echo chamber with many of us just kind of talking to one another, but not reaching a lot of people outside of our immediate social media community. And I actually like, listen, that lack of reach, it has a lot of impact. And one of them is for all of you who are resellers or makers or just like, you know, have your own small business within the slow fashion community. The reason people get hung up on your pricing or don't show up to shop from you and instead go to Target or what have you is because we're not reaching them. So they don't know why it's important to support you versus anthropology. So we're doing a ton of disservice by not connecting with more people. And that's got to be a priority for us going forward. And that doesn't mean we should stop sharing information and having these discussions with one another. It's very important. But real talk, we have to reach people who only look at Instagram, I don't know, for home decor inspiration or cute cat memes or to look at influencer posts. We need to reach people who only use Facebook or Pinterest. We need to reach all the Swifties who went to all those Taylor Swift shows and bought all of her merch, you know? We got to get to them too. We need to reach people who don't even know that fast fashion is a word. I guess it's a phrase. It's a pair of words that are ever used together. You know, to be honest, I don't give a fuck about Taylor Swift or the Kardashians or really any other celebrity unless they are on Star Trek or are members of Fleetwood Mac. That's it for me. (laughs) What I care about are all of the people within our community, right? All of the people out there who haven't yet joined our community. Just the regular people like us. Because guess what? It's all of us and the people who don't even know us yet who innovate, who get shit done, who make major change in this world. We are the creativity that forges the path to a better world. I've always loved NPR, proud, sustaining supporter for most of my adult life. And specifically, I've always been really touched by StoryCorps and This American Life. And really just like personal podcasting as a whole also is important to me. Maybe it's a reason that I gravitate towards podcasting as my medium, because these platforms are places where we get to honor and realize that every person out there has a story and passions and knowledge and experiences. Every person has a lot of really important things that they bring to the table. And that's what I love about this community and why it's so important that we grow it. I think we have a lot more success as a community and then as a movement in accomplishing our goals by leaning into and honoring what makes every single person around us special, including ourselves. We need to give ourselves some credit too, right? We gotta throw that imposter syndrome out the window and close the window as fast as possible. This is just another way in which we need to abandon the way the fashion industry operates. We need to, we need to do this by centering people, by welcoming people, by caring for people, because the industry does not do that. But slow fashion can and will. That was kind of the core of my conversation with Dustin. How do we reach people who generally don't care about fashion, who don't even know about fast fashion, who aren't in our immediate circle, but who are so important to making change a reality? And we were just like, throwing ideas out out there. Like I had this idea for a while about going to speak to various church groups, you know, visiting schools, doing more library presentations. I've toyed for so long with this idea of doing like a monthly Zoom meeting where I just like talk about a different topic. Anyone who wants to come can come and I'll take questions. And, you know, this is a way we can spread information and make it accessible. You know, I'm, I'm just constantly thinking like, how, how do we get more people in on this? 
We talked about other ideas, commercials on television, radio ads. We got stuck on billboards for a really long time, you know, like the billboards by the side of the road, because then you get to reach everyone driving by. And that's like a lot of people. And I don't know about you, but I do read billboards. And if one had the clothes horse aesthetic, I would be particularly captivated. I said to Dustin, imagine a billboard on your way to work that just showed the mountains of discarded fast fashion in the Atacama Desert in Chile that just said, your old clothes are right here. And then a URL for a website to learn more about fast fashion. Like how, how impactful would that be? Because, you know, you and I, we know that fast fashion is piling up in the global South, but we're like 1% of the people who know at most. We got hung up for a long time on putting a billboard in downtown Portland that just said, sorry, Nike is fast fashion. That's where their headquarters are. And honestly, we're still hung up on that one. So if anyone wants to make this happen, let me know we're in. <laughs> but these are the kinds of ideas that I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm still marinating on it all. And specifically, I'm thinking a lot about these questions, which I challenge you to think about as well. How do we get this knowledge to more people? How do we make this community more inclusive and welcoming? And how do we make real impact beyond likes and follows and social media popularity? If you have some ideas, I want to hear from you too, because this, this is a community, right? And we need everyone in on this and coming to the table with all the best ideas. So Dustin and I had this whole conversation last week, right? And I told him, you know what? That conversation with Michaela is the perfect episode for talking about the slow factory piece. I'm, I'm finally going to do it. Of course, I said that, but then I thought about it for like five more days. And I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do it. It's funny how things will happen at the same time that can either totally destroy your progress or reinforce what you were thinking, like kind of double down your commitment or I don't know, like make the picture even clearer for you while also maybe even taking your thoughts in a new direction. So I had this whole plan to talk about all this stuff. And then something else happened that, uh, well, I wish it hadn't happened. Um, and it was a complete surprise, um, kind of not invited to my life, I'll just say. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room. All while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriela Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriella Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. 
Slow Down NOLA only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers. And Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person. But they also have a website, so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at Slow Fashion Gabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at Slow Fashion Gabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at highenergyvintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about Remake, which is probably another organization that many of you are familiar with. I know many of you volunteer your time with them. They're another big player in the world of sustainable fashion and slow fashion. I'm going to tell you, I've been largely invisible to this organization for the past few years. And in the beginning, it hurt. It hurt so much to be left out of yet another roundup of the best sustainable podcasts. I took it as as constructive, right? Like as a challenge, because I was like, you know what? It's probably an indicator that my work just isn't that good, that maybe I'm delusional about putting together a quality podcast and I just need to work harder. Maybe I'm doing things wrong. I told myself that my work would get better with more practice, more learning, more time, and one day... They would find my work of a decent enough quality to share, or at least acknowledge. But over time, with some real reflection, 
I realized that I'm not on brand for their organization. And I'm not saying that that like felt like a good realization to make, at least at first, but I realized it was true. They focus on a more youth and beauty driven aesthetic. And that's, that's not what you're going to get for me. You know, they work with influencers and models. They kind of have their own in-house podcast produced by a staff member already. And to be fair, I am doing things, speaking about things in a way that is very different from the way they are doing things, right? And I'm fine with that all now because for some, the appeal of influencers and wealth youth, beauty, that's how we bring them into the slow fashion movement. Like we need counter programming to like Danielle Bernstein, right? Remake is reaching those people and that's important work. And furthermore, they do a great job, as I mentioned earlier, of mobilizing all of these passionate volunteers all over the world to spread the word of slow fashion. It's very important. I embrace that the community I am building, I don't even want to say I am building that because I don't want to be the center of it. I'm just going to say I embrace that I get to be a part of this community that is different, right? It's a place for the weird babes, as Dustin calls us, who have felt alone in our desire to make the world better. Now we have a place, you know, and it's with one another and it is fucking magical, right? Okay, there was this one weird thing. Not a weird babe thing. We needed another synonym for weird. Okay, we'll say odd. There was this other odd thing. The odd things always come in retrospect, right? Earlier this year, I was updating my website with press links under the advice of a friend of mine who was really smart about such things. And I used Google to track down all of these various times I'd been quoted or done an interview or written something over the past few years. And it was the weirdest thing. I found a remake blog post that quoted me as if they had actually consulted me for the piece. Now, I want to be clear that remake has has never acknowledged me publicly. They have had no interest in acknowledging me over the years. And finding that felt a little weird, But I figured, you know what? It's a volunteer-driven organization. Maybe someone listened to Close Horse here and there. And I kind of didn't think about it again. Around the middle of the day on Friday, just a couple days ago, as I was sitting at my desk working, I received a notification that Remake had tagged me in an Instagram post. And you know what? I was excited. Like, finally, I was being seen. Finally, my work is good enough. It was, it was that weird feeling, you know, of, you know, you want for so long the popular kids to notice you. They don't. Eventually you come to peace with the reality that they never will, that you're actually a weird theater kid or art nerd or I, you know, whatever. You spend a lot of time at the literary magazine, which I did. <laughs> You come to peace with that and you're like, you know what? Everything's going just fine. And then one day the popular kids finally do acknowledge you and you're like a little embarrassed, but you're also like really excited and, and, and you're embarrassed that you're excited. You know, I had never been contacted about any kind of collaboration on something. So I just assumed they were doing another podcast recommendation roundup and maybe finally close words had been good enough. Maybe I had finally reached a quality level that felt worthy of them, you know? Well, when I saw the post, my heart sunk. Well, that's kind of an understatement unless we're talking about like taking like a cinder block and just dropping it in the river. I felt sick and sad and humiliated all at once. The post was an out-of-context quote from the caption of a post I had shared on the Clothes Horse Instagram in April of 2022. So, so odd, right? And the theme of this carousel of theirs was retail therapy. And they so they pulled this quote from a caption from a post from like a year and a half ago. Meanwhile, I have discussed retail therapy 
so many more times since then in much more complex terms and even using stories from my real life. Like if you want to talk to me about retail therapy not being therapy, well, I can talk all about that with you. If you need a quote for a post, you can just reach out to me. If you want to work on a post collaboratively, I'm just an email away. I have thoughts, right? When I tell you I had to dig deep to find the source material from the quote that Remake used, let me tell you, it took some time because it wasn't in a carousel. It wasn't easily identifiable. It was in a caption from a post from April of last year. Like, it was a deep dive. You know what? I'm going to read you the whole damn caption from that post on April 25th, 2022. And then I'll tell you which part they used. If you've ever listened to the podcast, then you've heard me talking about my worst job ever, working for a so-called feminist retailer. That job made me sick, both physically and emotionally. Every once in a while, I like to check out their Instagram grid to see see if people are starting to see through their bullshit. This week, I noticed that they had a post saying something like, shopping between Zoom meetings is self-care. The thing is, this kind of retail therapy nonsense has been used as a marketing story for years, picking up major momentum during the first year of the pandemic. I'll never forget receiving an email from ASOS as my life was going down in flames that told me, you'll feel better if you buy something. Um, The thing is, most of the time when I buy something from a fast fashion retailer like ASOS, I am super disappointed because it smushes my boobs into a rectangle or makes me feel really bad about my body. So I end up feeling worse than I did before shopping. Shopping as a form of self-care, i.e. retail therapy, is often categorized as a maladaptive behavior. What's that? Behavior that prevents you from making adjustments that are in your own best interest. Other examples of maladaptive behaviors are passive aggression, withdrawal, and avoidance. In other words, things that make you feel worse in the long run. To get down to brass tacks and rant a little... I have bipolar disorder. I've been dealing with it since my teen years, and I've had some really, really hard times. I've caught myself many, many times using shopping as an emotional band-aid. I've seen it play a huge role in both manic and depressive episodes, and with very rare exceptions, it has not made me feel better. I get super angry when brands use mental health as a reason to shop, whether it's by creating product around mental health or explicitly telling us we should shop to feel better. I find it especially ironic that an employer who threw a massive monkey wrench into the stability I had found with my illness is telling others to shop for self-care. Okay, here's my question for you. What do you do to cope with your own ups and downs that doesn't involve shopping? So that's the full caption. It's really about the worst job ever and how much their advertising pissed me off. So Remake without ever contacting me, took one small part of that caption. Once again, it's close to two years old at this point, and I have talked about retail therapy in many much better, more meaningful ways since then. They took this part. I caught myself many, many times using shopping as an emotional band-aid. I've seen it play a huge role in both manic and depressive episodes. And with very rare exceptions, it has not made me feel better. I get super angry when brands use mental health as a reason to shop, whether it's by creating product around mental health or explicitly telling us we should shop to feel better. I actually think they didn't even include that last part of it. So they just cherry picked one small part of a much bigger picture from a person who writes and shares on the internet almost every single day. I want you to think about how many posts I had to go to that I had to sort through to find this quote, okay? I am a person who has not only an Instagram account, but an email address, a phone, a LinkedIn account, and on and on and on. I have the clothes horse hotline for Pete's sake. It would not have been hard to find me and ask me if I am okay with this or I would like to provide another quote. Remake's post also had a huge, huge fucking Clothes Horse logo in the center of it, and above it, it told everyone that in addition to being the host of Clothes Horse, 
I also have bipolar disorder. And low key, they a little bit misgendered me by not including that my pronouns are she, they, and just going with she. And the whole thing, well, I'm in my angry phase right right now, I guess, is what's happening as I'm retelling this to you. But I definitely, uh, I was really, really sad. Imagine, it's your big moment. You have been working so hard, well more than 40 hours a week for more than three years, pouring your heart and soul and time and creativity, all your energy into this project. You have passed on social activities, sleep, relaxation, seeing movies, reading books, because you care so much about what you do. This is your big moment when maybe you're going to get recognized for all of your hard work. And it's just to tell more than 100,000 strangers that you have been coping with a mental illness for decades to use a quote out of context that very seriously implies that you have a shopping addiction. I suppose that's what Clothes Horse is supposed to be about. To just throw out there to the world that I have this illness that has led to self-harm, hospitalizations, and many very difficult days, days where I woke up and thought, it is a miracle that I got to wake up this morning. Yes, I talk about my bipolar disorder with all of you, but that is because you are my community. You're my friends. You're my people. And it is one tiny piece of a much larger portrait that is Amanda Lee McCarty, host of Close Horse. All of you know that. I read that post and cried. It felt, it felt cruel. Like the only interesting thing of note about me is that I have bipolar disorder. And I'm going to tell you, when I list things about myself, bipolar disorder is like at best number 30 on the list. I mean, like all of us, I am a complex person, right? I'm more likely to list that I have a Hello Kitty tattoo as an important part of my character than I am to list my bipolar disorder because it's just not the most important thing about me, you know? And, you know, here was the other thing, why I felt so devastated. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 19 years old. I was hospitalized in a psychiatric facility after a suicide attempt. This had followed months of not being able to sleep, of increasing paranoia and anxiety, of shutting myself off from everyone and everything. I basically just went to work and school and that was it. Soon I stopped going to school because I was afraid people were looking at me. It was a lonely and scary time. And what had really set it off This whole episode that led to me being hospitalized, I don't know, maybe like six months prior, my mom had almost died of pneumonia and meningitis. And it was really scary for me because at that point, I didn't really know my father. And even though, as you know, if you've listened long enough, my mom and I have a very toxic relationship, um, it was really scary. My mom had been diagnosed with HIV I know my last year of high school, my next to last year of high school. And it was a time when HIV was a death sentence, right? A few years later, my stepfather would die of AIDS like so fucking fast. It felt like, it felt like we didn't even have time to say goodbye. And my mom being that sick of this thing that we weren't allowed to talk about in our family, uh, that I felt like I couldn't talk about with the few friends I had at school, uh, it kind of just like pushed this little button in my brain that sent me into one of the most powerful manic and depressive cycles that I've had in my entire life. Like I said, it was a really lonely and scary time. I felt like I could see myself living with this pain, like as an outsider, and there was nothing I could do to change it. But I didn't just develop bipolar disorder overnight. The symptoms had been intensifying for years. 
I grew up in an environment where the only person who was allowed to express feelings was my mother. Like I said, very toxic situation. So I never talked about the anxiety, fear, sadness, depression that I was experiencing. Like I would say for me, you know, I think when people think about bipolar disorder, they think about the manic episodes being like a nonstop party and shopping, overspending, you know, partying, that kind of thing. For me, my manic episodes were actually what I call an anxiety storm where my brain just can't stop worrying. It was a lot to deal with when you didn't know it was a thing, right? And I couldn't talk about it because my mom, no one was allowed to have any feelings. I got very good at hiding my feelings at a very young age. Also, the form of bipolar disorder that I had at that point and into my 20s was very rapid cycling. Like I would be happy and laughing at 10 a.m., drowning in despair by 11 a.m. It was very difficult to hide, but I worked so hard to do so. And yet my mom would constantly accuse me of being moody, telling me that it was a weakness. These moods of mine were a weakness and it would ensure that no one would ever like me, that I would have no success in the world and that I would end up alone. Just what you want to hear when you're like 15. Okay. And so this I was afraid of that. So I began to isolate myself from everyone and everything. I never hung out with my friends. I stayed in my room as much as possible, or I went on long walks alone. I just read magazines and tried to tell myself that I had to learn some self-discipline about my moods or my life would be ruined. Think of my teenage years as a very solitary time, which seemed contrary to all of the general opinion that was out there that those were supposed to be the best years of my life. Eventually, my mom asked me to move out because of my moodiness. She said I was too depressing to have around and no one liked me. It was weird because once again, all I did was hide my feelings and kind of hide away myself. I just felt like this unlovable monster who had been cursed with this bad brain and that I would be alone and unlikable forever. So I had nowhere to live. I'm in high school. I couch surfed for a while. I stayed with various friends until I worried that their parents would call CPS and send me to a foster home because while throwing me out of the house, my mom also had really fear mongered about what would happen to me in foster care. So I was trying to stay ahead of that. I was like, if I could just go to college next year, I'm only going to be without a place to live for a few months. So that was like really where I like set my goals. And eventually I moved in with a friend whose mother was largely absent, and that's where I spent the rest of the school year. I'm going to tell you, I was a straight A student. I aced the SATs. I never got in trouble once in school ever. Chronic teacher's pet, right? I had glowing recommendations from anyone ever. My teachers literally paid my college application fees, drove me to my job at the mall, gave me lunch and books, and so much care that I had never received from my own family. I'm the level of gratitude I have is just, it's just beyond. And you know what? I got into a lot of colleges. I got into every school I applied to. I got into some fancy schools, but where I really wanted to go was NYU. I really wanted to live in New York city. And when I got a scholarship to NYU, which is a very big deal for a low income kid from a small town, my mom responded with, well, Wait until they learn how moody you are. You'll probably lose it. By the time I received that diagnosis at 19, it felt partially like a relief and partially like an indicator, like an actual diagnosis of what a shitty, terrible person I was. Just as my mom had always said, this was undebatable. I kept it largely a secret because the few times I would finally open up to someone about it, it would be weaponized against me any time I expressed concern or feelings about anything, that any emotions I had were just a symptom and they were not to be taken seriously. And if you're in a fight with someone and they disagree with you, you can just shut them down with like, well, you're crazy anyway. What are they going to say back to that, right? I've never been able to find a good comeback. Now, to be clear... I am no longer ashamed to have bipolar disorder. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of time. I mean, like people told around me told me that I should feel ashamed because it would turn into my defining characteristic 
in their minds and nothing. It obscured my real talents and qualities. But no one should be ashamed for any disease, illness, condition, neurodiversity that they have. It doesn't make us less smart. It doesn't make us less talented. It doesn't make us less valuable. We all matter here. But I have felt that hurt of bipolar disorder overshadowing anything else that was good about me. I have been dismissed because of it. I have been robbed of my voice because of it. That's what this post felt like. Like they didn't have to reach out to me to ask me if it was okay because I'm just a quote crazy person, right? I don't have rights about this. And that, that was going to be the first time they acknowledged me publicly to tell everyone that I have a mental illness. So back to Friday, I'm sitting at my desk, just feeling miserable. I got up and I paced around. I made some tea. I paced around some more. And meanwhile, I began to receive messages from some of you. You were stoked. You were so stoked that this organization had done an interview with me, that they were finally recognizing Close Horse. Somehow that made me even sadder because it just, it just wasn't what I'd wanted. I didn't ask for this, you know, and I felt so epically disappointed among many other feelings. I want to be clear that I was never approached about working on something together. No one asked for a quote. No one asked to use my work. I just want to say that again, because I think that's really, really important. It indicates a fundamental lack of disrespect for me. You know, I swear I just sat at my desk for an hour staring into space. I didn't dare look at that post again because I just didn't want it to be real. I felt like I was the problem, being too sensitive. Perhaps I was just proving my mom's own belief that my feelings were a problem. I tried so hard to talk myself out of feeling terrible. I decided I would just let it go and never look at the post again, and hopefully that many people wouldn't even really see it. Finally, Dustin came in to ask me something, like into my office, and I just blurted out what had happened. And he was like, wait, what? That's so fucked up. And from there, the rest of the day is a miserable blur. I talked about it in the stories of my personal private account. I just had to be like, tell me I'm overreacting. Everyone said I, in fact, was not overreacting. I talked with some close friends who were like, this is fucked up. But I felt, I felt powerless to do anything about it because, once again, there are some really intense power dynamics at play in the slow fashion and sustainable fashion community. There are big players with a lot of power. Speaking out against them, like speaking out against Remake, is a fast track to a bunch of angry DMs. I just don't need it. And so many of you volunteer at your time, your money, your energy with Remake, and I didn't I didn't want any of you to feel bad, I think, or be mad at me for being upset. I just felt like I... I don't get to say anything about this. You know, there was this part of me that said they didn't think it was, I was important enough to reach out to me first. That's because I'm not important enough for anyone to care about this. You know, I didn't get any work done that day. I just missed like a half day of work because I was too busy crying and feeling miserable and trying to talk myself off the ledge. And that's a tough situation when you work for yourself. If I don't work hours, I don't get paid. I'm angry that this whole stupid thing affects these various aspects of my life. These, this thing I didn't want, like I lost at least $300 from not being able to work because, because of this thoughtless Instagram post. It's like, to say it out loud is, is embarrassing. Like part of me was joking that like, like I was kind of joking that I should just send remake a $300 invoice to make up for my time on Friday. You know, here's the thing. I talk about my bipolar disorder with all of you here and there, because it is one element of my own experiences as a person working in the fashion industry. It is one small element of my life as a person who has worked hard to limit my consumption. It is one tiny, teeny part of my life as a person who cares about shit. And I also don't want other people to feel shame for their experiences. That's why I bring it up. 
And you know what? It's my story to tell. And you are my people, but it's not the headline. And I'm going to tell you, late last night, I started to get weird troll comments on my post about it, about this situation, from people who had like zero followers and didn't follow anyone themselves that were clearly like weird bots or troll accounts telling me that if I'm going to speak uh, on my own profile about my mental health, then I should expect that it's okay for everyone to talk about it. And I like was deleting them one by one. It was just like so so annoying. And like, I was like, where are these people coming from? Definitely was making me like very paranoid and anxious. But once again, this is not the headline. My mental health is not the headline of what I do at Close Horse about what Close Horse is. It's my story, right? And I use it when it, when I want to. It's quite another thing for an organization that has ignored me for years to decide to use it without talking to me. I am not a mental health influencer. Neither my podcast nor my account are about mental health. So it feels like such a weird choice when there are plenty of great people out there doing work in the area of mental health awareness. And it feels like an even weirder choice to go back to a post for close to, at this point, two years ago. It was hurtful. It was traumatic. I felt exploited for the sake of likes and followers by a much bigger organization that has the funding, the recognition, and the opportunities that I can only dream of having. By an organization that has always made me feel like I'm not good enough. That post just reinforced that they still think I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to reach out to, to treat like a human being. No one had enough regard for me as a person to say anything to me. Well, what's happened since then? Not much. I woke up Saturday hoping that it was a bad dream, but my inbox was flooded with messages from many of you. I didn't know what to do. You know, like on one hand, I wanted it to go away because it was really embarrassing. How humiliating to think maybe you were doing a good job, but really your mental illness was just fodder for a carousel post about retail therapy. To be honest, I don't think they even needed that quote for the post. It was so weird. And I'm not sure why they went back to that post from last year. The whole thing. I try not to like be paranoid, but it makes me really paranoid. (laughs) So I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to talk about this again. I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. I'll answer these messages in my inbox and then that's it. But on the other hand, I didn't want this to happen again to me or to anyone else. And it felt like it needed to be a conversation. It illustrated everything I had been talking about with Justin last week, everything I had been thinking about for months. How do we take this community out of social media? How do we make people feel welcomed and valued and respected? Because they are. How do we eliminate the scourge of competition in favor of collaboration? Because real talk, there's a lot of weird competition, a lack of support within this community right now. And I don't like it. We don't win when we're trying to take down one another. In fact, the whole world loses when we decide to hold one another back. So I sat down on my computer in my bathrobe and I wrote out something to share on Instagram. And I gotta tell you, wow, y'all just showed up to share kind thoughts, support, and encouragement. I... I was afraid that a lot of you were going to judge me or dismiss my feelings, tell me I was overreacting or I'm a ding dong or whatever. But I got to say, I have never felt so loved and appreciated in my entire life. And I got to say, the last two years in Texas have been so isolating and lonely. And it turns out all along, I was part of this huge, amazing community. Like what, what a life changing experience knowing all of you has been. So it's Sunday. I'm recording this. I haven't heard from Remake. Uh, Sometime on Friday, I think in the evening, they commented on an old post of mine from last month. Once again, what's up with these old posts? I don't know what they're doing. They commented on this post from last month saying that they had DM'd me. So I went and checked my DMs, but I don't have any DMs from them. And maybe that's because my anti-troll filters are filtering out out something that they said in their message. But 
you know, real talk, when you send someone a DM and they read it, it's Instagram tells you that they've seen it. So they know I haven't seen any message that they may or may not have sent me. At some point on Friday, Remake pulled that slide from their post and turned off commenting and still had me tagged in it. I might still be tagged in it. It's really weird. You know what? I'm a human. I have just experienced something deeply hurtful and traumatic and a DM is not the way to address a public humiliation and violation like that. It's like, send me a fucking email. Apologize publicly. Treat me with respect. Honestly, they're just proving how unimportant I am in their eyes. The responsibility for fixing this should not fall on me. I know so many of you have shown up to comment or message them or what have you, tag them in posts. And I am like, well, one, I wasn't expecting that. Once again, I thought when I talked about this publicly, you would all be like, you're overreacting, you're silly, whatever. Uh, I wouldn't have expected any of you to do that or ask you to, but I want to tell you that for all of you, I haven't seen any of these comments or anything. I've just heard about them. I'm like so grateful for your support and for making me feel like in a weird way, it makes me feel safer, which is something, it's something that I needed. Honestly, I felt very unsafe on Friday and now I feel, I feel like there are all these incredible people who, who will look out for me and I just, I'm not a person who gets to feel safe very often. So it's amazing. (laughs) I have this plan that I'm going to write an email to them. I tried this morning, but I just felt my mom like kind of over my shoulder telling me that my moodiness, AKA my bipolar disorder will always overshadow everything I do that I can't actually be of any value to this world because of my brain. That's kind of what that post seemed to imply that the most important thing about me is what's wrong with my brain or different about my brain. Maybe tomorrow I'll be able to write that email. I just don't know what to say. Maybe I'll have some suggestions for what I should say. I just, I don't know yet. I do want to say though that many of you support Remake in a variety of ways with your time, your money, sharing their content with your community. I do not think you should stop doing this. You should continue doing this. The work all of us are doing collectively is far more important than this incident. A stupid, hurtful thing on social media pales in comparison to the rest of the human suffering happening on this planet right now, thanks to late stage capitalism. We have to keep the work going. And I know that Remake has helped a lot of you do that work and find your voice. We can't, we can't discount that, you know? At its core, The most important part of this movement is the people, right? The movement does not exist without all of these humans who are working towards the same goal. And because this entire movement is built of people, of course mistakes will be made. That doesn't mean that the work of these people is no longer valuable or no longer important, no longer heartfelt. But what it does mean is that apologies have to happen, right? Accountability needs to happen. Because we all need to be tender and thoughtful of the other humans within this movement. And while I wish this whole thing would just go away and never have happened, I can't help but see it as another symptom of some elements of the slow fashion community that are just not working well right now. Over the weekend, I received messages from various people who talked about their own negative experiences, some honestly downright traumatic and hurtful working with various organizations within the slow fashion world, including Remake. It made me really sad. I want this to be better. I want the slow fashion movement to be everything that the fashion industry never has been. And here it is. We're being clicky and shitty like the fashion industry. This is not supposed to be an exclusive movement. This is not supposed to be an exclusive movement Movement limited to only a certain group of people. If we allow it to be that way, we will accomplish nothing. The world, the planet, its people, they all lose out. We have to do better. Okay, well, that's all I have for you. And it's a lot, I know. Um, 
Thanks for listening to this if you did. (laughs) Uh, So now we're going to jump into my conversation with Michaela. And honestly, it's so weird how things just like happen and come together all at once. It's so wild. My conversation with her ties so well into everything I've talked about so far. And just re-listening to it during the editing process got me so excited about the power of this community, the potential of this community that you and me and Michaela and so many other rad people are a part of. So let's give it a listen. All right, Michaela, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? My name is Michaela Friedman. I am uh, an artist first and foremost, and I live here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I moved here in 2020, kind of kicking and screaming. Um, I didn't really want to come to Texas in the first place. <laughs> I hear you. It just felt very unnatural. So <laughs> yeah. I moved here from Philly, um, and I started working in kind of like editing. I'd always been an editor on Photoshop, like Photoshop editing. But yeah, I moved here from Philadelphia, and kind of like in the middle of 2020, nothing was happening really, and I really wanted to become a part of the creative community here. So after 2021, I started working in markets and like doing pop-ups with a bunch of small businesses. And then that kind of like built into more, more of a a bigger business. So I work for, um, with Courtney Cavill with Mutiny Market. So I started working at Psychic Outlaw with Rebecca and it went from just kind of doing photography into more of like assisting the business into more of like a creative director role. Um, And I think producer is like the best word to describe exactly what I do in all of my jobs. Like a creative producer, I think. I like that. Yeah. I think that sounds right. It's like vague enough that it could be anything. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Which it really is when you're a small business owner. It's very much just like constantly switching hats. Oh, totally. I think, you know, sometimes when you're a small business owner, you're like, I need to go get a corporate job or something. And I've talked to people who have only been small business owners who need to do something like that. And they're like, I don't know what to put on my resume. And I'm like, everything. Everything. You can literally do everything. That skill set area, put like every single skill that you have because it is like, I think being a small business owner is the most important job, top of the line, most important job you could ever, ever have. You just learn so many things. You do. And you have to learn how to deal with people. You have to learn how to manage people. And mm-hmm. you have to do accounting and social media. Oh, and it's giving me anxiety. Merchandising. <laughs> I know. But it's, it's true. Yeah. Like, I think, you know, before we started recording, you know, by the way, everyone, we're actually recording this IRL here at Shop Slow here in Austin, Texas. And uh, we were just talking before we were recording about how, like, Man, when you are a small business owner, like a lot of people don't understand like the customer service Mm -hmm, grind. mm -hmm. People will come in and not even understand that the stuff here is like handmade by Mm -hmm. a person. I mean, all the stuff we buy is made by a person, but this is like very intentional, slow fashion. Exclusively made by people. Yeah. Like people that are also working in the store. Um, But yeah, it's definitely like probably it's the scariest thing I've ever done, but also the most rewarding. And I think when you have a storefront, it like ups the ante a little bit because you're directly talking with people and consumers and trying to make them understand the movement and what's important. Yeah. It's hard. You know, a couple weeks ago, I recorded an episode with Danny of Picnic Wear and she said something that like really, it's really stuck with me since then, which is that ultimately like the message of slow fashion, the knowledge and education Mm. that comes along with it, like sharing that and really like getting out there why fast fashion and fast everything is problematic. The responsibility of doing that education has fallen on all of the makers and small business owners. It's not, it's not coming from like the media in a big way, even though I have to say like NPR has been talking about this kind of stuff more, which gets me so stoked. But in general, it's coming from all of us who are just there on the ground. Like right. it's like a grassroots movement. Yeah. But it's also really hard because when a customer comes into your store, whether it's IRL like here or, you know, online, and they are not from that world and don't know the story behind it, sometimes they don't want to hear it. Yeah. And that's oh, yeah. hard, right? Yeah. You have to like immediately read the person when they come in and be like, okay, are they going to even <laughs> digest my spiel about this? Because I could talk about it forever, but I kind of have to like 
it's it's interesting, you know, someone who's who comes in and they're a little bit more like you can kind of tell by what they're wearing already. If they, I'll, I'll say when they come in, I'm like, oh, welcome in. Thanks for coming to Shop Slow. Have you ever heard of the slow fashion movement? And some people will be like, oh, yeah, that's great. I, I know all about it. And I'll be like, awesome. Well, then you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then if they say, no, I, I don't know anything about that, I'll just go into the spiel. But it is like I've had to incorporate this like educational aspect while also trying to get people to like shop the store. Um, so it does, it does kind of like weigh on you a little bit as, as a creator and designer. Like my role has just, I've just added another title into, (laughs) (laughs) into what I do, which is fine. But yeah, it does get a little, you know, at the end of the day, when you're working an eight hour shift at the very end of the day, you have a party of 10 come in and you're just like, have you ever heard of the slow, (laughs) (laughs) you know? So it's just like adding like mental load onto your you're already like very heavy load of running a small business. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately like getting people to understand that is how your business will be successful. But like if you like manage like at Target, like you don't have to, Mm -hmm. when people come in there, explain why people should shop at Target or really sell them anything. People just go in there and buy it themselves. And so it it is a very, a very different business model. Yeah. And it's different than with, so to explain Shop Slow a little bit, we started as Psychic Outlaw, and Psych- Psychic Outlaw was only online. Um, so that kind of that like that metric kind of exists only online. So mm-hmm. when we opened the store, you know, it it changes. It that metric completely changes. Like, how do you? You know, do people want to be talked to while they're shopping? Do they want like a more personalized experience? So we kind of are playing with that in in the retail side of things. Um, and it's been kind of cool. Some people do want to be talked to the entire time and taken through the whole store. And some people want that target experience where they just want silence. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's hard to read, you know. Right. So it it's 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 interesting. And I'm such a talker. <laughs> <laughs> We are made for this. Clearly. I love it. I do. I like. I really like people, and I like learning about them and where they exist within not just like slow fashion, but just in their own lives, how they're consuming things. Um, so maybe I'm a bit nosy, but blame that on like ancestral roots. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, well, let's let's talk a little bit more about Shop Slow because. You know, you just opened in what, like October? So we, yeah, we opened, we were like in our soft open era for about 40 days. We opened on October 6th, which was the first day of ACL here in Austin. And then we had our official grand opening on November 18th. Okay. So we just wanted to like beta test everything before we were really, truly open, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. And like the thing about opening a store is it is, it's a lot. It's Mm -hmm. incredibly risky Mm -hmm. from a financial perspective. But honestly, like the advice I've been giving a lot of my clients recently is like you need to diversify where you sell to meet more people because like for so long – a lot of businesses, I'm sure you saw this for yourself, mm-hmm. could, specifically in the slow fashion realm, could succeed or at least sustain themselves v- via solely posting on Instagram, yeah. I swear, right? And we're that has changed. Oh, yeah. Right? Big time. Big yeah. time changed. Yeah. So it's really wild to open a store, but like I also you know, think it is a way that you get out there and get to spread the word to a new crowd of people. That said, like what... What and how and why did you decide to do this? Oh, man. Um, Well, I think, uh, yeah, selling online definitely changed. And I think in the last two years, we kind of saw it move slowly. And, you know, with, like, the algorithm wanting different things, it kind of became this, like, evil entity. And I think um, uh, one of the things that I do, I work with a group of women – for Slow Fashion Festival. And we put on this three-day event with panelists. And you were there on our first, like, inaugural uh, chapter, I guess. And since since that first um, show a year ago, we have been invited, like, a bunch of different places to do these, these fashion shows. And we got invited to um, the Hollywood Climate Summit out in L.A. in June. And Rebecca Wright of Psychic Outlaw came with us as a designer to walk in the show. Um, so it was definitely a work trip, but also Rebecca and I, like, we had, we were in L.A. So, like, yeah. we were like, okay, cool. I'd never been to L.A. before. Um, and we were shopping around. 
and I, I think we were on on Melrose, and there are all of these tiny shops just full of vintage and upcycled materials and like clothing that we had just never seen before and things that you couldn't really find online really like they were just like organic we found them organically while we were shopping and you know unfortunately I didn't really buy anything spending freeze <laughs> so I get it spending freeze in <laughs> LA right is, now. is wild yeah but that's hard <laughs> if you if you have like determination you can do it I, yeah. I promise you but um we kind of like I, I was in the store and I'm up top on this ladder looking at probably shoes and I looked down at Rebecca and she's like standing in the middle of the store and just looking around and I could like see the gear like turning in her mind and I think when you work with someone for like so closely for a year you can just like telepathically read their mind and I was like this she wants to open a store and then we started talking about it and when we came back from LA she was like there were so many opportunities to like buy these clothes and try them on outside and or you know in the real world and she was like maybe that's what we should do so this is june of this year and i was like that's not we we can't do that <laughs> that seems like a I'm, lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i've seen the books i don't know i've seen you know so we we were like shopping around and Rebecca comes to me one day and she's like, I think we should hire a realtor to help us find a place. And I was like, all right, like, okay, let's see what we can do. <laughs> so like every morning we're on Zillow, we're looking, we're on, you know, what any app that we could find to like look for a place. And these guys are like, well, what, what do you really need? And we're like, we want like, like a flex space. So we need like a retail store, but also we want to have all our sewing in the store. And they're like, okay. So I don't really know that they understood what we wanted because they were showing us like, you know, 4,000 square feet of warehouse and there's no air conditioning and it's a dirt <laughs> floor and there's lifts for cars. And we're <laughs> like, this is not it. This is not what we want. And it's really, uh, I don't know if you've looked at commercial spaces in Austin, but it's insane. You can't find anything for less than, oh, it's, like, it's just, it's wild. It's wild. I don't really know how people are, <laughs> like, able to find such amazing spaces um, for less than like $20,000. But uh, this place kind of just like fell in our laps. And Rebecca was like, if we don't take it, like we're going to miss the opportunity. Um, so there was a bit of a risk. But in the end, like, I mean, it was it's perfect for us. It's the retail space is in the front. And then we have our studio in the back where we're making most of the handmade clothing. And then we also have you know, enough space to do consignment with other small businesses and other designers who use upcycled textiles. So it felt very organic, but it also feels kind of wild. We uh, we found the place and then we both knew like we immediately had to open. We had because we, we needed to make sales. Mm -hmm. So we're making sales online while we're also fixing this place up. <laughs> and, you know, like I'm like caulking the side of the wall because there's a hole. And Rebecca's <laughs> like, did you put the shipping outside? And, you know, like, uh -huh. like did you post today? So it kind of like it it was kind of like this crazy two weeks. We we opened in about two weeks. I think it wow. was 15 days. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes in a weird way, that's just like the best way to roll. It was awesome. Yeah. I, I was so awesome. Um, I, you know, my, my partner, Dylan, he helped build everything. And then we had, you know, it was like a, a village came together to put this together. And, um, we had like a lot of custom things made by Be Lavish, who's a, a, like actually a wedding venue company and they hand make all of these beautiful bars. So they made our wonderful checkout counter and she's so glowy and lovely and it just, it felt very organic and it it's lovely to have like an actual space. You can tell people like, Oh yeah, meet me at the shop, come over to the shop and like yeah. try this on. I'll measure you. So like, you know, there, the world is filled with stores <laughs> They're yeah. everywhere. Yeah. How have you – like, what's your approach to uh, Shop Slow? Like, how how is it different from all the other shops out there? I mean, like, you're here. This isn't going to mean anything to anyone who doesn't live in Austin or hasn't been here. But mm -hmm. you're on South Lamar where it's literally, like, store, restaurant, restaurant, store, bar, mm -hmm. store, coffee, store. Like, right. Yeah, it's busy. Off to, up to the river, basically. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, how is Shop Slow different 
I mean, I can feel it when I'm in here, but obviously people who aren't listening aren't here with us right now. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's a small little store. It's uh, the front of it is the retail side. And then the back, you can see right through to where we make all the clothes. So there's sewing machines. There's, you know, maybe some scraps on the floor. It's very much like worked in. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's more of like a transparent space. It's somewhere that you can come. And if you do want to be talked to the whole time, <laughs> I, I will gladly gladly take you around and, you know, say, like, oh, well, uh, you know, what are you re really looking for? Do you want a light jacket? Do you want, you know, heavy pants? Um, we constantly carry around measuring tapes because we want people to not really look at the sizing as much as like understanding, okay, so I, I personally have a 44 inch chest. So I know that these clothes over here are going to fit me really well, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's more of a personalized experience. And I think that you don't get that in Target. You don't get that in the shops, you know, close to the river. You, <laughs> it's, it's something that is kind of more, um, it's conscious consuming. And I think that we can kind of handhold here a lot more. Um, I want people to start like coming in and being like, measure me now. Tell me where I can shop. Like, <laughs> you know, cause you, you should know those things. It, yeah, it's, I agree. It's like a mixture of educational and, you know, capitalism, but like <laughs> consumerism. Um, but we want you to feel good about shopping. It's just kind of more of a yeah, like you're, we're leading with our hearts here rather than just making wanting you to spend your money with us. Right. I mean, here's the thing. Like I – and we're going to talk about this more in a couple of minutes. But I think like in the slow fashion community, you know, we obviously have a lot of anti-capitalist views because yeah. we all see how capitalism has gone awry and is poisoning our planet and sucking up all of our time to work at jobs to barely mm -hmm. get by. I could go on mm -hmm. and on, right? Mm -hmm. You're not in your mm -hmm. head. You feel the same way. Oh, yeah. Right? But at the same time, and this is the thing that I see a lot of pushback on social media about, is like you can be anti-capitalist and have those views and also recognize that, unfortunately, we still have to opt into the system right now. And yeah. so we all need to like pay our bills, yeah. have a place to live, eat food, theoretically get health care, things like that, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, that means we have to either get a job working for someone else or we have to sell something. But regardless, we we have to participate in capitalism in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with making and selling stuff, you know? Like, I think it's just about, like, what I like when I come in here and what I know of you and Psychic, Psychic Outlaw and all the other brands in our community is that you're all working so hard to do things in a different, better, more ethical way. Mm -hmm. It's really hard work. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you do that because one, you need to exist in this system, but also because you care about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's hard. It's hard. I, I, every time I talk to someone who's like a maker or a designer in this space, they're like, you know, random people always say to me, like, why do you care so much? Like, why, why do you worry about it so much? So why do you care so much? Oh, man. I I think I don't really – I don't really know who I would be if I wasn't making stuff and just, like, very generally, like, making anything. I've always made things, always worked with my hands. So I think that, like, first and foremost, I care about the ability to create and whether that's, like, a tangible creation or writing or film or recording things, you know, like – just making in general is really important to me. And I know for so many other people, that's like, that is our outlet. That is mm -hmm. like our spirit. Um, it's just like so deeply ingrained in my soul that I have, to, I have to put stuff out. I will combust if it, <laughs> if it doesn't happen. I right. know so many people feel that way, but I think for, to have found a place like this where I can come and and it, it's like a part of you know like yes I, I want to be able to sell things because um, I do need to make money but I also want it to feel organic and conscious and this is kind of like the the crossroads of that where mm -hmm. like you know I think as an artist also like fashion is always at the top of of my mind like how the world sees me as an artist is important so I you know I want to dress like my spirit feels but can I you know can I do that at Target Absolutely not. Like, I'm not, you know, I, I'm just not going to find that. But I think as far as, like, capitalism and consumerism, you know, we have to play that game. I have to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, young anymore. I can't live in squalor. I can't be, a, you know, super 
poor artist anymore. I have a, a dog and a partner and you know all these things that I want, but I feel like these little stores are important, especially because it feels like, you know, like you're part of the community. Mm-hmm. And, and when you have people coming in, it feels like you're even closer to that community where, you know, these, we can talk about it too, the, the large retailers that want uh, want you to come, like want your small business to pop up inside of their store oh. so that they feel like they are doing something. It's like that, that weird, um, it's like greenwashing in a way. It is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of those things that really, really bugs me. And I'll even say that, listen, I worked as a buyer for the fast mm-hmm. fashion brands for a couple of decades. And I was often that person who would reach out and say, hey, cool maker, designer, small brand. How would you like to come and do X, Y, Z with us or sell mm-hmm. on our website or do like do a partnership with us, like blah, blah, blah. And it, while I, at, on an individual level, really came at it with good intentions, mm-hmm. right, and really wanted to support and uh, give a platform to these voices, I know that my employer was not looking at it that way at all. Like they wouldn't have let me do something like that if it didn't benefit them in a much ma- like bigger way, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, you know, ultimately it was like free marketing. Yeah. Right? It's like, hey, we can put this like sort of like a wash of green mm-hmm. on our business. <laughs> uh, this like uh, create this illusion without actually having to really address the systemic issues of how we run our business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they're not doing, they're not actually doing the work. They're, they're not like, you know, it's, and it's, it's, you can lead that with like so much consciousness. You can try so hard, but you are one person in this giant company, like, you know, f- from, cause I, I've worked in corporate America too, and it sucks, not necessarily fashion, but like trying to change how things work within a corporate sense is like pretty much impossible or it feels impossible. But as a small business, you know, like I've done partnerships with a lot of brands where they like come to the store, um, pop up with us, do live painting with us and we'll pay you to do it. But then afterwards there's, there's like no cleanup really. Like there's no, you're like attached to them for just such a short time and then they just forget about you. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny because companies like that to reach out to me like every week to come and be on close horse. And mm-hmm. I'm like, excuse me, sir, uh, you have the budget to pay for marketing. You're asking me to do like 20 hours of work mm-hmm. for free for you for your benefit, not for mine. Like this is such a like, you're painting this as an opportunity for me, but really it's an opportunity for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes like, listen, if I were a maker and someone came to me and said like, hey, would you like to sell it or pop up or be featured on our homepage or something, I would have a really hard time saying no and 50-50 odds of saying yes, if not greater, because, hey, I need money. I was just telling you before we started recording, Mm -hmm. my health insurance is so freaking expensive expensive right now. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, and and like, so I I guess, you know, I was actually like kind of going off in my own head while I was taking a shower this morning about this idea of sort of like, purity Mm -hmm. uh, within the slow fashion space of like, it's often people who actually don't have to like live and survive within that space that are like, I can't believe you partnered with that brand or I can't believe you have ads or I can't believe that you did that pop up. And it's like, I got to exist. It's I got to make money, yeah, honey. I don't judge anyone who partners with any brand because like I feel it. I understand. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but there is this like... I think anytime we set ourselves up in for really black and white thinking, like this is good, this is bad, and there's no gray area in the middle when it comes to anything, we are setting ourselves up for a world of hurt yeah. because nothing's ever going to play out that way. And I think slow fashion is one of those spaces where I see people like really – not the makers and the brands per se, all of us who are out there trying to make a living in this space, but more like the people who are within the space like – you know, trying to be activists, trying to make change in their day to day life, trying to reach the people around them. I think I see people beating themselves up over like how imperfect they've been practicing it, and I that makes me so sad. Like I, an example I'll just throw out there is like, you know, there's like a lot of 
bad faith messaging on social media that like if you make more than a certain amount of money you shouldn't be thrifting which mm. is like come guys mm. come life on is way more complicated <laughs> than that like someone on on tiktok was like well can you talk about the ethic the real ethical issue here which is all the rich people who go thrifting and i was like I have never seen someone wealthy thrifting and like someone might have a good job and also have like a hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Like it's not for right. me. They might have a chronic illness. They might be taking care of relatives. It's not for me to judge. Yeah. Everyone needs to shop secondhand. But I see people being like, oh, am I like not qualified to shop secondhand? But I also don't want to buy stuff from Shein. Like what should I mm-hmm. do? And they're like spiraling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think it's like that quest for this level of perfection that makes people give up. Yeah. Absolutely. I see it a lot. Yeah. I have have felt it before, and this is something that I will talk about with my friends, too, who kind of have that, like, like educational fatigue or, like – or maybe not educational fatigue, but just you feel fatigued in general. Like, am I doing everything right? Am I, like, making a conscious choice every time? And, like, you know, you have to kind of, like, give yourself some grace and, you know – like with the ethical purity and like also wanting to partner with big brands, you have to allow yourself to be like, like, look at your budget. Is it worth it within <laughs> yeah, your budget yeah. as a business owner? But I think like, you know, how can you allow yourself, like make allowances for yourself, mm-hmm. but also like take part of it, you know, like it come it can come it can start small like you can start oops excuse me <laughs> you can start doing things like you know one thing at a time one day at a time it doesn't have to happen so fast and mm-hmm. and i think that with social media and instant gratification we are so used to seeing things happen in like no time like you know a lot of people like will show like patterns of growth you know, in like a 30 second clip. Like, oh, I think that's a great call out. Like, yeah. social, it, we have to remember all the time that social media is the highlight reel of people's mm-hmm. lives. And that 30 second clip of them swapping into like completely reusable packaging, here's what you didn't see along the way was yeah. them throwing away a bunch of plastic, them trial and erroring that that stuff, them yeah. looking for the right thing, them making all these changes. It was really like a year, you know. The money spent. The money on top spent, of that. the time spent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I think that I think that's a really good call out that like social media puts on this pressure that like you have to go from zero to perfection in about right. a day. And I think that that's that's really discouraging. Mm-hmm. And I think that like as members of the community, as leaders of the community who really set the example, it's really important for us to be transparent about that and and help other people feel proud of the progress that they've made. I think with slow fashion, it's not just slow fashion movement. It's like the slow movement. You are like very intentionally slowing it down. So, you know, it's even, even as a, a marketing manager and social media manager, I do that too. I add, I'm like, we can speed this up. We can just, whoop, let's make this a seven second clip. <laughs> well, because, that's, you know, that's what people want to watch. I mean, like they, it is. data has proven they want to, they, they want to change quick. every second. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. They want it quick. And it's, it's that, it's that like, you know, the kind of like brainwashing we've like done to ourselves with social media. But I think when you take a step back and if you do want to go, you know, completely zero waste in your home. Like it's, it's not just buying the beeswax paper, it's finishing the roll of aluminum that you bought Uh and then, you know, trying to figure out what to do with all the bits. And that, that slowness is consciously shifting your, like allowing yourself to shift slowly and, and make more ethical choices, like non intent or what am I trying to say? Um, when you like, what is the word for it? Dang, it's a uh, intentional buying, but like, like Black Friday sales just happened, right? right. And I was like, I want a blender. <laughs> I really just in my head, I think it was probably like eight o'clock in the morning, and I've been thinking about a blender for a really long time. I really want a smoothie at home and not have to pay like fifteen dollars <laughs> for yeah. a smoothie here in Austin. But I'm I got online, I'm looking at the deals and I put a bunch of them in my cart. And then I was like, wait, 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 this is ridiculous that I'm like about to buy a blender for no reason other than it is Black Friday. I can wait until I find a blender Mm -hmm. because it's on my list. It's on my shopping list. 
when I go uh, to like Goodwill or anywhere like secondhand, Blender is like at the top of my little shopping list. Mm-hmm. And I've I've found a couple good ones, but I still am waiting. Like, you know, non what is it called? Impulse. Impulse buying. Yes. Oh, no, yes. Impu- okay. No yeah. impulse buying. No impulse buying. It's just just like very consciously allowing yourself to buy things, but no impulse. No, like, you know, it has to meet all of these standards. Like you know, if you had a list of things that you wanted to find in a partner, you wouldn't just drop it all for some Joe Schmo. You well, know, you, you got might, at least you for might. a while. <laughs> you yeah, might. yeah. No, I mean, I think I think that's a really good call out too. I mean, this is that time of year where impulse shopping is like really, mm. it's like encouraged. Yeah, right? it's like yeah. a way of life. I mean, the blender is a great example. Like, you know, I. I actually do make smoothies every morning with our blender, and Love I'm so smoothie. glad we have it. Mm-hmm. But my journey to getting the right blender took a really long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it's okay. It's like, okay. It's you yeah, don't need yeah. a smoothie every morning, right. and it's okay to like hold out for the perfect blender. Yeah, and if it's a secondhand perfect blender, that's great. Yeah, totally. I mean, you I know? think for me, like I grew up very low income, and so anytime I wanted or needed something. It was kind of like, well, what's what can we afford? That's what mm-hmm. we get to have. And you know, a lot of times you end up with stuff that isn't that great because yeah. you're you have the limit. Like you're like, I guess I'm gonna go get this blender at the at like the family dollar and it's gonna be all plastic and it's gonna break mm-hmm. really fast. It's like the tax on being poor, basically. Yeah, you oh, know. Yeah. Um, and that really stuck with me as I reached adulthood and I was still struggling financially and I would still just buy what I could get you know, because that's what I could afford. And then I shifted into shopping secondhand because often I could get something better yeah. for what I could afford. And it became like a way of life. But over time, what that really taught me was like better to wait a year to find the thing that you want than to buy something because it's available and yeah. easy and have so much disappointment, frustration over over time with it, ultimately have something that you now have the burden of like disposing of because it broke and it's not fixable. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's like, For me, that's been like a whole slow journey in itself. And I think that's a big part of what it means to live that slow way of life. Yeah, definitely. Holding out. Holding Holding out out. for the real thing. It really is. In relationships too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, It goes for clothes too, like, you know, higher quality garments. And that's kind of what we want at Shop Slow is truly like the highest quality you can find in dead stock material or in, you know, a quilt or even like the shoes and leather that we have here. It has to be something that's going to last you, but we want people to make those choices consciously. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it also, it means a change in how we live our lives because all of us who have become adults during the fast fashion era and can go to Forever 21 and spend 50 bucks and have like three outfits. I mean, what a time to be alive. Mm-hmm. I remember it, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would wear that stuff to go out that weekend. 50% of it wouldn't survive to be yeah. worn again, you know, and that was just how it was. And it got us into this habit of like everything new all the time, more, more, more. The more stuffed your closet is, the better. Oh, the yeah. more shoes you have, the better, even though you probably wear the same two pairs over and over again. The more bags you have, the more eyeshadow palettes you have. It just like it piles up, right? And ultimately, what we need to do is make that change and say, I'm going to have less things, mm-hmm. but they're all going to be way better. Yeah. I think I got more, I, I found my style after starting to shop secondhand more frequently. And mm-hmm. I, I grew up similarly to you where like, we didn't have anything really. Mm-hmm. And it was very fun to be able, my mom could give us $10 and I could go and get totally. a bunch of stuff from the thrift store. And that was that was awesome. But I think once I grew up a little bit, I started learning like what my personal style looked like. And through conscious shopping, I became more of a creative dresser and like, you know, putting things together that I had found. But it it just kind of I don't know. I think it's sweeter when you find that piece that you have been looking for for a long time and you can incorporate it into your your wardrobe that might be small. But. You, you just like love it a little bit more because it's like a treasure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. 
Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at republica underscore unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. 
Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. So that brings me to the quandary of it all, right? Like you are a maker, a designer, a brand owner, a shop owner in the slow fashion space. The quandary is you need to sell stuff in order to survive. Yeah. <laughs> but you also don't want people to go out there over consuming. Now, I will preface this by saying if people are over consuming slow fashion, actual slow fashion, I don't really see it happening right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But how do you find peace within that that quandary? Yeah, that's a great question because I think it's a battle that I think about every day. Um, but I, you know, it's 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 wanting to kind of keep your community close, and by that I mean like we have a storefront now. Mm-hmm. So what can we do with this space as a as a maker, like? I'm not just going to sit in the space alone. I have to invite people in and, you know, offer the space up as an event space. Do we hold workshops here? Do we create more of a community, um, you know, kind of like, yes, okay, we want to make that profit, but what can we do with that profit other than just like hoard the profit? Mm -hmm. You know, you need to kind of keep it circular and transparent. And I think offering the space as a community meeting zone or, you know, just just a place to come and learn how to mend or something like that. That that can be really kind of like a balance to this overconsumption. We're we're educating while we're also kind of inviting you in and, and learning and just kind of being together. We want to create this like you know, contributing like as like a, a leader rather than just someone who wants to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think like I you touched on something there that is like I don't know, like a little light bulb formed above my head as you're talking Mm -hmm. about it, which is this idea of the money being sort of circular, the money flow Mm -hmm. through like a a slow fashion business. Because like if I went to Target, and I'm sorry we're picking on Target, but I mean- We were picking on Target hard, but I mean, it's easy. Yeah, it's (laughs) easy. easy. They make it easy. (laughs) Substitute any big box store in there. TJ Maxx, whatever. So if you go to Target and you buy some stuff today, they're going to take your money, right? That's Mm -hmm. how it works. You're exchanging for goods and services, Mm -hmm. right? And they're going to pay a little bit of that to their employees, but they're going to underpay them. They're going to understaff. They're going to do everything they can to maximize sort of like the profitability of their employees, right? And that includes the people who make the clothes, ship the clothes, all the stuff, right? Um, And then at the end, the money gets kind of hoarded. Like it – it maybe some of it gets paid out to shareholders. Mm-hmm. The company holds onto a lot of it in the self, but really, like they're kind of hoarding money. Yeah, you know, a small, a very small group of people is hoarding this money that they've taken from us, right? And in a slow fashion business, what's happening is like the money is moving from the customer. It's paying the employees and the owners, but it's also being used to benefit the community. Yeah, and so the money almost like moves in circles. And instead of this, like, linear, yeah. just, like, now yeah. it's being hoarded somewhere. I always picture, like, like the Scrooge McDuck vault. vault. Like, <laughs> like I know this isn't real, but I like to imagine, like, it's, a, like, Target headquarters. They have one, right? Oh, or every Target has companies. a giant pile of golden bricks underneath of it. Yeah, and there's totally. just some some big man sitting on top of it being like, brick me again. And, yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's exactly. that's, I promise that's you. That's exactly what it is. They're, yeah. in, they're in the basements, but that <laughs> <Yeah>. doesn't <laughs> But, like, I think that that is the really big difference in that, like, listen, Capitalism isn't going to go away anytime soon. I know everybody's calling for this, like, total revolution upheaval of mankind and society. Mm. And, like, listen, I I watch – I love Star Trek. They live in this post-capitalist utopian future that I love for us where there's no money. But even in Star Trek, there are plenty of people, humanoids, (laughs) aliens out there in the universe who are like, nah, dog. Yeah. We don't don't roll that way. We love capitalism. And I think that – that's because there's something intrinsic within humans that's like, 
I must exchange goods and services for money and vice versa. Yeah. And so I don't see in our lifetimes that ending because it's it's just what we're used to and mm -hmm. it's what people like. They gravitate towards it. And so the best thing that we can do is live within that system and make it more ethical and make, yeah. make that circularity of the money the norm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think... I, a friend of mine always says this, Leah Burry, she says community over competition. And mm -hmm. then I like to add creativity over consumption. So while you're in those spaces, you know, specifically small business spaces, it's, it's kind of up to the, the owner, creator, maker to create a space for creativity to happen or just for conversations and dialogue to take place. And you're, you're totally right. Like I don't see, I don't see the fall of capitalism truly, you know. It's, <laughs> I mean, I it, love the idea I of love it, it, right? Yeah. yeah, it just doesn't seem... doesn't seem probable. <laughs> like, I feel like I shouldn't plan on it, Yeah, you know? And yeah. so it's, it, because by planning on it or assuming that that's the direction we need to go when it's probably not achievable without just the loss of so much human life, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's better to say, how do we make the system work in a better way? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And to, to like focus our efforts there. Yeah, kind of think more outward than turning inward. And I think, you know, with with having to make money, a lot of the time you are kind of working in a silo where you're like, can I afford to make my rent? If I don't pay, if I don't mm -hmm. sell this pair of shoes, then I can't have heat in my house. And it it makes it very me me me. Where you know, if you are making a profit, why not turn it out and and welcome people in and you know try to create a more community based effort to, you know, educate and, and just involve people in a way that's not, not normal. I think after 2020, people were really looking for that kind of community space and it was really hard to find. Yeah. And I feel like I got very lucky, you know, just meeting people who were also very eager to create space for creativity and, and talk about these kind of hard things. Um, Austin, for whatever reason, was a great space place to do that. Um, it still is, you know, there's some, some issues with it, but <laughs> I think that, you know, it makes sense that slow, uh, like slow fashion is happening in Austin. It just feels very organic to me. Yeah, I think it does too. I think you're right though. Like there's something 2020, I think made us all realize how much more we need community than we ever realized. Yeah. yeah. And I don't, you know, three, three years into this, like I don't want people to lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I worry mm -hmm. that we are for we are once again disconnecting from this community that we've built. And f to me, a better future really lies in bringing more and more people into the community, spreading this knowledge, spreading this way of life. Because most people don't know the things. Yeah. That we know. Yeah. Or they don't have the language to talk about it either. Like, you know, you... You don't want to sound preachy. You don't want to use mm -hmm. big words that are are exclusive, and you want people to feel, you know, it can be very um, overwhelming when you well, <laughs> <laughs> it is when no. you talk about it because the depth of of waste is so big. Yeah, uh, it's just so big. For uh, Psychic Outlaw, we source quilts from uh, outside of Dallas, and they're at these giant rag houses. And every time we go in, it's just it hurts so bad. It makes me just feel so. Like I, there's no, I have no control over any of this stuff. And, um, we go and it's just like piles and piles and piles of textiles that just tower over you and they're in boxes. And there are these things that at one time were loved so much and then l just discarded. I mean, people just get rid of everything and it makes you feel so small in this world of waste, really, um, so we get really dark there, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but it, I, it's... I feel, I mean, I feel this way all the time. Yeah. And the thing is like, even for those of us who are like in this space all the time, thinking about it, learning this stuff, we only see the tip of the iceberg yeah. because so much of this is hidden for really obvious reasons. Like most rag yards will not let you take photos or videos. No. And there's a reason why, mm -hmm. right? Um, fast fashion doesn't want you to know all the stuff that they make and we never wear. I mean, 40% of the clothes that are made every year are never worn, where are they? Imagine being know. confronted with the piles of those. I know. This is where it I, like, hurts. start spiraling. <laughs> yeah. But I do think, like, once again, like, community outreach and being welcoming and thinking about how we share that information in a, 
I don't know. I hate using the word digestible because people will always be mm. like, and they mean it in a complimentary way. Like, I love how digestible you make this information. And I'm like, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to make it easy on everyone, mm-hmm. but I want to connect with people. And so that's why I want to use simplified language yeah. and really clear. Like, I really work hard to follow the path of how your brain would process the information. Yes. Like, I think about this a lot. But when you talked about like, the vocabulary and how intimidating it can be and how overwhelming. I mean, that is like, that, that touches me so much because (laughs) when I began working on Close Horse, I was like, you know, there were people out there talking about sustainability and sustainable fashion, definitely not in the way that we are now, by the way, like we've made so Mm -hmm. much progress. A lot of the conversation then was, was really shame-based for one. Like, you should feel bad for participating in the system, and here's why. And two, it was very, like, jargon-dense, I guess. And I was so fearful. I was like, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an environmentalist. Uh, I'm just, like, a person who knows things and cares about things. How do I get people to take me seriously and listen to me? What if I use the wrong word? What if mm-hmm. I make a typo? Because people will come for you. Oh, you yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. And I think our fear of getting it wrong, of using the wrong terminology, of misstating the facts, uh, it can be really – it can it silences us. Oh, yeah. Right? And this is something that I have been moving through and growing from since I started Close Horse. But what I, I guess what I say to people <clears throat> is, one – don't be a jerk on the internet to people who are trying <laughs> really hard because I see it all the time where I'm like, wow, you did a great job. And someone else will be like, yeah, well, I can't really read this font very well. I'm like, hey, they'll learn from that. Let's be nice. They worked really hard, right? But also, like, rather than feeling as if you have to regurgitate this this language, these words that aren't natural to you, say it from the heart. Let mm-hmm. it come through you and process it and come out genuinely as you would say mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And you're actually going to connect with people more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You're going to attract more flies with sugar. Yeah, exactly. You know? Sometimes I'll go like on like an – like, you know, I'll go on like the Greenpeace website or something and I'll be reading like a study they did and I'll be like, wow, this is like in – I don't even know. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming and it doesn't – it feels like too much information for me to understand. I have to really digest this slowly. This – I cannot just copy paste this and share yeah. this with the world, you know? And I think – I think we're, we feel this pressure to be so fast, but really, once again, like slowing down your processing of that information so that mm-hmm. it generally comes out in your voice yeah. is important too. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. And I, I think like, you know, you wouldn't push a baby that's learning to swim into a pool. Like you would ease them in gently. I mean, maybe eventually you would push them into the pool, but you know, you have to like give people their grace and, and kind of like, you know, allow accessible language to happen in order for people to grow and learn. And, you know, that's kind of when someone comes into shop slow and I'm like, have you heard of the slow fashion movement? And they say, no, my first thought is like, don't use the big word. Don't, (laughs) don't scare them into like, you know, like not understanding what's actually happening here. And it's that, you know, the core of slow fashion is to be accepting. And I think Mm -hmm. my, one of my oldest, oldest friends, Taylor Broussard, she's like, this wonderful goddess woman. And she's always said, even when we were very young at 15, she was like, you need to practice radical self-acceptance. And still not very good at it all the time. (laughs) It's it's just not something that comes very naturally. But I think with slow fashion, it's acceptance is like one of the core, like a pillar of slow fashion. Yes. You know, and accepting like, you know, the uh, the the consumerism part, capitalism part. You have to accept that. Accepting like that people don't know where we are, or or what it is. Um, also accepting that like your big words are scary. <laughs> <laughs> but I I do think that like you know creating access through language is important. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I agree. I think like acceptance, accessibility, inclusivity. These are key pillars of the mm-hmm. slow fashion community. So something that. I mean, it, it comes up a lot in conversation on social media mm-hmm. is this idea of that so many people are social media activists, mm-hmm. but don't carry carry it out into the real world, right? I think this is a challenge for all of us who are like 
working hard, mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to exist while also like feeding and clothing and washing ourselves and taking care of our kids, our cats, our dogs, trying to live life. It is really hard and intimidating to say like, okay, now I'm going to, or to, I don't know, to be confronted with the question, how are you living this in real life? Like, what are you doing out in the real world? Mm-hmm. Although, side note, I will just say, social media is real life, and I get really tired of people dismissing it because we socialize in a different way now, mm-hmm. and social media has a major impact on on us and our brains and what we do every day and how we feel um, and the decisions we make, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. This whole community basically exists because, thanks to social media, yeah, you know? Yeah. So I, whenever I see somebody be like, well, what about real life? I'm like, oh, well, social media is real life. Have you heard? I recorded that. It's real. It's yeah, happening. it really happened, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but, like, what else can people do outside of, like, sharing and discussing these things on social media, which, to be fair, is a big help? What else can they do beyond that? Yeah, definitely. I think your voice really matters. Obviously, mm-hmm. voting, understanding um, legislation, what's happening in your town locally and, like, you know, state countrywide but i definitely think that kind of like talking to your friends is really the core i think just Mm -hmm. talking to the people that are around you and especially you know talking to family members where i come from it they are like i think people are very poor and they are naturally just part of the slow movement um you're using your butter tupperware for your pasta from last night like it's just you know it's things like that that are very like honestly i always thought people who like had tupperware or like bought like rubbermaid containers or whatever they were like rich people rich rich because yeah yeah, they were like (laughs) oh oh my like they're one percenters like Mm -hmm. i was definitely well into adulthood before I had leftovers that were not served in an I can't believe it's not butter tub. Yep. Seriously, country yep. crock tub. I still can't stop myself from saving every single piece of plastic, like takeout things. But it, it also, it's, you know, you can use them for so many things. Oh my gosh. We're packing to move right now and our jar situation is oh, wild. Wow. Well, give them some, give them some. I love pickling. <laughs> I love pickling. But I do think that it's like, you know, they're, they're little processes that like, can manifest. And it's just from saying like, Hey, do you know, you can actually, you can keep that thing. Or I have this, I have this blender I'm not going to use anymore, or I'm going to upgrade. Do you want to switch it out? And like those, those little processes with your community is really good. Um, but I also think understanding, you know, from like my standpoint, talking about transparency within like workers rights and like, okay, we have sewists here who are in, in shop slow. They actually sew in the shop. You know, there's like a workshop happening here, but we're paying them. And when I tell people who've never sewn anything before in their life, they're like, what? You're paying, like, what do you mean you're paying them a livable wage? And then we can start talking about that. And it's, it's just little things. You don't have to have all of the, the words. You don't have to have all of the, um, you know, uh, the vernacular for, for these things. But I think also unlearning and relearning as a process that you use every day rather than just that one big, you know, one moment that you're going to get rid of all the plastic in your house. You are yeah. slowly learning that it's like, okay, and you're relearning how to use a new thing. And it just kind of organic. It feels better if it's organic. Um, yeah, so fashion is not a trend. So you should be really using it as as means of like to just better yourself over time, better your community and your friends over time. Not just one one week is not going to cut it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like you said, slow fashion is not a trend. And I so my big focus for 2024 for Close Source is really shifting the conversation from fast fashion specifically because really fast fashion is just a label for fast everything mm-hmm. for an entire culture that we live in now that you know deprioritizes health and well-being and the planet and, you know, stifles workers and, you know, just ruins quality of life for so many people. And I think one thing I've been doing the past year when I have these conversations like one-on-one with people is really framing it as like, hey, remember when you worked at the mall Mm -hmm. and how you made $4 an hour? Like that's part of this system. Yeah. Right? Or like this thing happens and then these people suffer. People you know. Yeah. You know, like really framing it, making it not such a distant problem. In the beginning, when I would talk 
about fast fashion, you know, in 2022, we're dealing with like the pay up movement and all of these orders being canceled and garment workers literally starving Mm -hmm. because they had no money. And people would hear that and be like, oh, that's really unfortunate. But to them, it was a distant problem. To them, it was like, well, things are different there. Things are different over there, right? That's what you would always hear. And over time, it was like, okay, what we really need to talk about is how this actually impacts you and everyone you know and love. Absolutely. It's it's like a bigger thing, which would sound more overwhelming, but actually makes it more like – it hits home. Yeah. And it motivates you. Yeah. Right. Distant problem is a really, I've never thought of it that way because I think with, you know, people on social media not believing that it's real life, <laughs> yeah. it is a distant problem. It and is. It is kind of these like working in silos where you're like in your own little bubble of social media and, and it is, oh, I, I just watched this thing about, oh, these people, these poor people, they're they're so far away from me. It must not really be an issue. It's different. It's, it's always yeah. like it's different there. I worked with this woman who had previously worked at Nike, and this was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. This is before I was even a buyer. And sh- she was telling me, I was like, wow, like I don't – even back then I was like, I don't support Nike. Here's why. They've had all this evidence of child labor and, you know, wage theft and horrible conditions for their employees and – She was like, Amanda, I have been to the factories where the kids work for Nike. And this was like, theoretically, this is not happening anymore. This is like 20 years ago. Mm. So just take this with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. She said, the kids want jobs. They're happy to have jobs. They were all saying, thank you for giving us jobs. She's like, things are just different over there. And I was like, no, kids should not need a job. Yeah. That's the problem. I'm sure they're glad to have the jobs because it's that or starve. Or someone told them that. Right. But kids shouldn't be in the position to choose between making sneakers and eating or not making sneakers and starving. Yeah. And she was just like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. A five-year-old here is a five-year-old over there. I know. You I know, know. Things like, are not different no. over there. Yeah. Right? Wherever it, over there is. There you know? are issues here, too, with, with garment workers. And just because it says made in America doesn't oh, necessarily mean it's like, actually, like this, that, it's that the uh, we're the best country in the world. We're made in America. But it's made by someone who's just making pennies. Yeah. You know, like yeah. there's there's that. It's the distant problem. I really like that. I'm going to have to add that into my spiel when people <laughs> walk in. <laughs> but it, it's, you know, that's why I think it's great to have the the sewing in the back of Shop Slow because you can literally see what's happening. I think people forget that your clothes are being, for the majority, you know, your clothes are, are being made by someone. Yeah, um, yeah. Like they have not been able to find a robot that can sew clothing well. I think oh, people yeah. think that like, you know, and I, and I get this, like I watch this how it gets made or whatever it's called about Cheetos once on YouTube. And I was like, whoa, (laughs) Cheetos are legit like food science completely made by machines, Mm -hmm. right? That's not how clothing is. Clothing is actually made by people. It's not just like you drop the fabric in one end and clothes come out at the end like a conveyor belt. It's like actual like sewing and cutting and folding and pressing and pattern work and understanding bodies and yeah. It's not Cheetos. It's not Cheetos for sure. (laughs) Very different. But I think that we assume in modern manufacturing, that's how everything is made, which makes it even more of a distant problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that there's just someone who stands by the machine that makes the clothes to make sure it doesn't clog up. Like at the Cheetos factory, right? Isn't that crazy? I think that's very American of us, (laughs) honestly. Well, I do think like thinking about it as like a distant problem, we have in the Western world, in the global North, we have been very lucky that we are shielded from almost all evidence of our overconsumption because most of our waste, it just gets pulled, it just gets picked up every week. Yep. It goes somewhere, right? But the stuff we drop off at the Goodwill bins, it goes overseas. You know, you get to see that stuff when you go to the rag yard, but Mm -hmm. very few people will ever see that, right? We don't see, we don't go to the Grand Canyon and look down and it's full of old clothes, right? But people who live in other, in the global South, they legit get to see that and oh, be yeah. confronted with our overconsumption every day. And they also get to be confronted with the misery kind of of working in that supply chain, right? We don't. We For us, it's like, oh, I had a tough day. I went to Target and I had to wait in line for a long time. Mm. That's like the worst stuff we see mm-hmm. firsthand. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, the low quality, poor fitting product that we end up with. But like the real repercussions seem so distant. And 
you know, I'm glad that I can go to the Grand Canyon and look down and it's not full of clothes. But at the same time, sometimes I think that would be really good for us. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh, definitely. I, th- I think social media, like, that's part of, I think, you know, trying to be transparent and, and show people what's really happening here. And it is hard to record in, in the rag house unless you pay um, money. They want money. It's it's all about money, you know, and it it's we, – we're kind of lucky we get to work with someone who is – who gets it really, but that's so, that's so rare. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't want you to see it. And I don't know, I don't, I don't have the answers to solve that problem yet. Um, but it's, I've been thinking about it. How do we kind of bring that more to the light? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also very, very hard for me to talk about it. Cause it is so, I mean, it is like <sighs> the, the, it's just an immense weight and it, just the things that we do find are are beautiful things, and they're just, I mean, gone. Like, they are just discarded. They're going to be sold to Mexico and and just ripped up and buried. Maybe not even ripped up. Maybe, you know, just buried. <laughs> that makes me, yeah, it makes me so makes sad. Me so sad. I know, I know. And I, th- I wish, listen, I would love to go undercover in a rag yard, <laughs> but I'm not really sure how that works for me. <laughs> Well, I think this is like this is weird because it's it is exclusive. Like it, you either have to know somebody to get mm-hmm. in there. You have to pay an exorbitant exuberant fee, and I think with just it, it, it it's inaccessible. Yeah, it is. It is uh, the truth is often inaccessible. Oh, yeah. By yeah. design, unfortunately. I feel like I sound like a conspiracy theorist saying that. But, I know. But in this space, it's really, really true. You know, like that's been kind of my mission for the past few years is to be like, here's what I actually know firsthand, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why you don't know that, you know? And I think right. the more of us who experience these things firsthand, who can share them and talk about them, the more real it becomes. Absolutely. Knowing that this is hard work and that it all happens slowly – how do we stay patient and not get up, give up? Like, how do you stay, how do you stay in it? Oh, yeah. I think just passion. I think I just, I know it's important. And I think that bringing light to these pretty severe and heavy issues is is a big thing. And I don't want to... I don't want to have to put it on someone else's shoulders. Like, I think as someone who is creating things and objects and putting them out there in the world is also my responsibility to bring awareness, you know, to the movement, I guess. And I think it does help having a community around you that just rallies and having people to talk to when you're feeling that like overwhelming sense of, oh, is this even worth it anymore? People understanding me. Um, But I, I think, you know, I was very lucky to find a community here that allows you to kind of shift some of the weight off. And that's, I think, the most important part is community and just believing, you know, that radical self-acceptance and believing in yourself so much that you can you can just kind of push past it and keep it going and keep moving. And yeah, while also allowing yourself some grace to be slow. Yeah. 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 I think those are all, those are all really it's good advice. <laughs> it's really good advice. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without having friends. And I don't know what I would do without even online community, you know, people Mm -hmm. that aren't really very close friends, but just being able to like, kind of have that camaraderie online. It's also been really helpful for me. I do think like people are both the problem and the solution. (laughs) You know what I mean here? Like, and I think it can be really easy in the face of what we, you know, the day-to-day existence right now and learning so many grim facts about all of this, it can be really easy to kind of start to like hate people. Yeah. I have definitely had days where like, like that, where I'm like, I don't, if the next person who DMs me, I am gonna Mm -hmm. think unsavory thoughts about them. That's as far (laughs) as it goes, right? But like, definitely it can be really hard to have faith in humans and remember how much you love them. But it is the people around us our community that are, they're the key to a better future, right? Like they're an important part of this. And that's where we'll find both our, our comfort and our support, but also the solution. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. This was so great and really fun to do it IRL. Uh, Do you have any final thoughts before we call this the end? Final thoughts? Um, I think just 
talk to your friends more, talk to people online, allow yourself to make mistakes and learn from them. Um, call people out <laughs> nicely, politely. <laughs> nicely, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think like radicalize your family. <laughs> I think so too. As you were talking, I was like, yeah, talk to your parents and talk to your siblings mm-hmm. because even like my stepmother was like, you know, your dad's been listening to your podcast and now he won't buy polyester shirts anymore. Go and dad! I know. And I was like, that's a win. If all the dads, <laughs> all the dads, all the dads stopped buying polyester shirts, right there is like a big impact on the shirt industry, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, that and just create, end and change. Yeah. One, one, it's a domino effect. Yeah. Dad starts talking about his really cool new or like, you know, new to him shirt and they found it. It's a treasure. Then, you know, someone else that he's talking to is going to just keep, they're going to keep on moving it. So I think it's just slowly pushing that needle a little bit. And if it starts with your pops, then that's great. Yeah. Get the dads involved. Go dad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you to Michaela for spending some time with me and getting me really excited about the future of slow fashion. Like I needed that after this interview was recorded a couple of weeks ago, but listening to this weekend while I was editing, it was like medicine for me. It made me feel rejuvenated, you know? I hope y'all are feeling the same way because it was incredible. I'll be sharing all of Michaela and Shop Slow's info in the show notes. And I hope you visit the store IRL if you ever visit Austin. It's so cute. It feels so special and homey. Feels like a real hub of this community here in Austin. And I got to tell you, I've been obsessing over this dress I saw there. And I might have to give it to myself as a holiday gift before I leave Austin because it's got hearts on it. You know, I love heart print. It's incredible. There's so much good stuff there and so many amazing people are involved. Okay, one last thing I just want to remind you is of the reseller survey. The deadline is December 15th. I'll share the link in the show notes. I think we're at a little bit more than 300 responses right now. I would love to get to 500. So please, if you haven't taken it yet and you are a reseller of secondhand, please do it now. Um, One last thing. You know, earlier in the episode, you probably noticed that I used the phrase weird babe, obviously a gender neutral term as a non-binary weird babe myself. Dustin first called me a weird babe way back when we started dating. I can almost like picture the moment. And at first I kind of bristled at the notion. I was like, how dare he call me weird? He has terrible pillows. (laughs) But the truth is, I I am weird. I have always been weird. I literally read the encyclopedia for fun as a kid. I dress like I'm in a cult if Laura Ashley designed the uniform. I have built with Dustin complex backstories for all of our cats. I mean, I collect artificial fruit, you know? I'm weird. Dustin is weird. My friends are weird. Y'all are weird. We are all weird babes. All of us. Many of us, myself included, have felt left out, watching from the sidelines in the past. We care so much about things that other people don't even know about yet. They're going to know because we're going to tell them. And we support one another. This amazing community of weird babes, all of you, you got me through the pandemic. You've gotten me through the last few days. You inspire me on a daily basis. You challenge me to learn more, reflect more, and work harder. You motivate me to keep going. Weird babes will change the world. We're going to do it together. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. Written, researched, hosted, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you liked what you're hearing, maybe leave a rating, possibly even a little... I don't know if you're feeling a little spicy, a review on Apple Podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. But most importantly, tell your friends because that's how we grow this community into a full-on movement, right? If you haven't picked up the theme of this episode yet, it's getting all the people involved, right? (laughs) Um, If you'd like to support my work financially, Uh, which I would love. There are many ways you can do that. You can learn more at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast, or you can sign up for the Apple premium subscription, which gives you access to our full archives for a mere, I want to say $3 a month. I think we've got two subscribers so far. (laughs) 
Um, or you, there's a link in my Instagram profile where you can just send me a little tip for today's episode or anything else you've been wanting to send me money for, whatever. Um, or you don't need to do any of that at all. Just share the podcast, share the content, get the word out there and keep up the good fight. Um, thanks as always to my other half, Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. And I will talk to you all next week. Bye.